My name is Rob Cooper and I am a stained glass artist in Jackson, Mississippi. A typical day for me might have me painting a church window at the same studio where I learned the craft 27 years ago, which is a pretty amazing place called Pearl River Glass Studio that's run by owner Andy Young. In the evening, I'll probably be using the same type of materials and a similar approach, but on a completely different piece in my home studio where I'm surrounded by all kinds of things that inspire me, which can be objects from my childhood or just an arrangement of scattered ephemera that happens to be lying around, plus the occasional barking dogs and cat that passes through. I never imagined I'd be working with glass for this long after my internship with the glass studio, but to this day I can still be surprised by the results of trying out new ideas with the medium. So I think it's safe to say I'll be working with it on into the future indefinitely. One of the elements that draws me to glass is the way it interacts with light. It never gets old to see how the characteristics of a window can change so drastically just because the sun's in a different part of the sky. I'm almost always working on top of a light table, so when I finally get a window finished, the first thing I want to do is hold it up to the daylight. Unless it's after midnight, of course, in my studio at home, and I have held pieces up to the moonlight just as well, and it's always interesting. Another compelling aspect of the medium of glass is its history. It's fascinating that of all art mediums available that have a rich past, the stained glass may be the hardest to separate from its religious background. While you can practically create anything you can imagine with it, it's still deeply rooted in that history. Working for so long in that tradition has given me a deep respect and appreciation for that very history, and I still spend a lot of my time painting church windows. So when I switch gears to work on ideas and designs of my own, I realize that having worked so much in the liturgical world of glass, certain elements find ways of crossing over into my own work, which is something I don't really mind, and actually if I don't sense that that's happening, it seems like an element's missing or that maybe I'm not quite hitting the mark. My own work draws from an appreciation of literature and also from elements of pop culture. It's always interesting to see if I can bring the inherent qualities of what would be called a devotional work of art into a subject that may not normally be seen in that context. The inherent nature in the imagery of church windows whether it's scenes from the Bible or portraits of saints call for a certain mood or of grace or serenity in order to resonate with the viewer. So as I'm painting a portrait of an author, a scene from literature, or even something from nature, I'm always aware of that devotional gaze that's inherent in the tradition of viewing stained glass in its original context. I also keep in mind that people look to religious windows with a sense of reverence and maybe even hope to have guidance or a type of dialogue with the artwork itself, especially during difficult times like the ones we're in. Recently, for me, that dialogue with stained glass took a surreal turn when a particular author I had recently painted a portrait of reached out to me to ask if I could create a window just for him no less than the creator of American Gods, author Neil Gaiman, was sending me direct messages on Instagram after he came across the portrait I made of him, telling me how much he liked my work. Having been a huge fan of his writing since my teenage years, I knew I was actually getting a literal dream job, like one of those moments when you find yourself fantasizing about working for one of your personal heroes, but instead of it being a fantasy, it was really happening. So what came out of many emails back and forth over several months was the idea to create a vast library scene not unlike the library of the dreaming depicted in Neil Gaiman's very own Sandman comics. And arriving at that decision all of a sudden I had the opportunity to combine my literary interests with anything and everything that would for me make up the ultimate stained glass window. 
And later on, the window turned out to be fairly large, so it was also the first time I had to create a crate just in order to ship the work overseas. The process of creating a stained glass window has its own particular set of demands. You can basically create any type of image you want, but at some point it all has to be mapped out or charted out in order for the image in mind to mesh with the materials. I normally start the process with a sketch or even a collage before I think too much about the glass. In the case of Neil Gaiman's window, I started with a small concept drawing that led to a much larger full-size drawing to inform every bit of painting that might happen on the glass itself. The steps involved in translating the drawing or imagery into a physical window have pretty rigid parameters. Luckily, working at such a large studio, I have access to some pretty amazing glass, and while I start the search to find the right pieces of glass for the design, I catch myself identifying with Charlie in the Chocolate Factory getting ready to invent his first piece of candy or something like that. So interacting with the glass directly is a great way to allow the work to move beyond what I could do if I tried to plan all of those decisions on paper or beforehand. It's pretty exciting to move the glass around over the artwork to see how it can come together. And once you find that perfect arrangement, the window starts to take off. Along with the inherent beauty of the glass itself, it can be manipulated in so many different ways. Layers of painting that get fired in the kiln is what I tend to do the most, but certain glass has the potential to be distressed or treated in a way that reveals an entirely new color underneath its surface. Glass as a medium has so many seductive qualities that it can almost be like looking into a crystal ball. With all the different ways to get imagery onto glass, one of my favorite techniques is something I stumbled onto by accident. Acid etching has been around for quite a while and it's certainly the most caustic and dangerous method of manipulating the glass surface. And one day while acid etching, a manufacturer's number was etched onto a piece of glass due to the Sharpie marker residue it left behind. I realized there could be a lot of potential for mark making in a completely different way than I was used to. So over the years I've done several pieces using that approach, which has turned out to be really effective, but it's definitely not predictable. That level of unpredictability is part of what drives my interest in creating new work, and I thrive on not knowing exactly how a piece might turn out. But at the same time, I have enough confidence with the medium to allow that to become more of a dialogue with the materials instead of being a hang-up. Glass cutting takes a predominant part of the early stages of a new window since every piece has to be cut from a larger sheet of glass. Once all the glass is cut for a window, I make sure my imagery is ready to interpret onto the glass surface. If I'm not etching, I'll move straight into the painting process, which involves taking powdered pigments that have all kinds of toxic metals in them and working that with gum arabic and water to get a thin solution that can be brushed on and later manipulated to bring out texture and dimension. Glass paint's always fired onto the surface of the glass in a kiln in order for it to remain permanent, which also allows for a type of layering of paint to happen where each piece of glass that's painted can go in and out of the kiln several times before it's complete. Once the paint firings are done, building the windows, the next step that can either involve wrapping each piece of glass in copper foil or the more traditional method of using lead cane. At the glass studio where I work, on church windows, I rarely build the windows much since there's a really talented group of people there that take that on. I'm still part of the team at Pearl River Glass after so many years because it gives me the best of both worlds. I get to work at an incredible facility with amazing people, but I can also stay put in my little hermit hideout when I need more time at home to work on my own work. 
And just recently, my wife Wendy has joined the crew at Pearl River Glass to get more familiar with the craft herself. So either way, I consider myself lucky to be around so many talented people working in a field that has fascinating and medieval origins.